Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning a series of video courses being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Our course is entitled Cultural Studies and we are at the moment in module 4 and we will be looking at um, a, a very contemporary and a very important topic namely cyber culture. But as always let us do a recap of what we did in the last uh, lecture and also see how this current lecture ties in with some of the things we have said before. Well, you will recall that the last lecture was devoted to science, technology and culture and we said that science, technology and culture um, takes off from what science, technology and society studies had given us. We also talked about um, you know how philosophy of science, important figures like Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn and their interrogation of science had to tell us and the way in which it um, contributed to the development also of, of the cultural studies investigation of science and technology. We first, please look at this slide, we first saw that uh, even cultural studies as uh, methodology as a school of thought, it, uh, it was also a reaction among other things that is its origins were to be found also among other things in the reaction to positivism, okay, the positivistic school where you know some of we found that some of the characteristics of positivism were science as distinct from other areas of human creativity, science as being infallible, okay? science as having a methodological uniqueness which too was infallible, science being value neutral and observation as theory dependent etcetera. So, we saw that positiv positivism carved out uh, or you know uh, showed or gave such a picture of science that science was something removed from human beings. Okay. But in the humanities we know that any knowledge system be it science with all its findings, all these findings, its findings are definitely work, okay. still are uh, you know science is still um, a domain that is that has been created by human beings. So, it is important as a cultural activity that we should look at science and the work of scientists. Then this is the point that I had just made that the origins of cultural studies was really an insurgent sociology against functionalism and positivism and also a critique of instrumental rationality. Okay, the findings of science leading to techno science um, tended to be in quite instrumental in its reason. Then um, we saw that scientific or sorry cultural studies of uh, science and technology um, is underlain by these two aspects or these two propositions which are not different from the social studies of science and technology, but it is something that is shared okay, with social studies of science and technology. These being the fact that scientific knowledge too is socially determined and culturally specific. Then therefore, we, uh, we said that uh, as far as culture and science and culture are concerned, science was seen as culture okay, and also which led to the study of the cultures of science. By cultures of science, we mean the practices of the scientists and the scientific community. We also saw science and technology as shaping culture. It was not just one way around that science and technology were socially determined, science and technology also shaped culture. And if you go back to the last lecture, we remember we gave the example of um, Isaac Newton's Principia and how it contributed to British mercantile capitalism and in uh, you know and at the same time was informed by you know um, British mercantile capitalism right. We also saw the example of colonialism, colonial science and how colonial science was not is not something that we study as 
you know, um, science that is not removed from the bigger, the larger colonial enterprise. And we saw that it had, it should be seen as related to race, okay, uh, to race, to racism in relation to uh, the um, existing knowledge at that time, etc. Then finally, uh, you know, uh, cultural studies, as you know by now, um, focuses on how cultural practices impact or change, um, uh, you know, change um, subjectivity and identity. And in that sense, if you ask a question regarding subjectivity, like what is it to be a human being? You know, how do you define a human being? We find that increasingly, you know, the answers come from uh, domains of science like genetics, science and technology in general and the medical sciences. Today, the definition of the human being is also extended to embrace the cyborg and today's lecture um, in that way is related to the last lecture in the sense that it looks at cyber culture and it looks at you know um, the cyborg or uh, the human being, what happens to the human being, how identities and subjectivities change okay, as human beings begin to use technology and to extend their abilities through technology. Now, this was a slide which I missed in the last uh, lecture because there was no, there was not much time and I would like to end this recap by quoting from the challenge of science by Andrew Ross and he asks where Andrew Ross asks this question why should cultural studies critique science what is the need okay, for cultural studies to investigate science at all. Um, and then this is this uh, beautiful answer he gives and I am reading from Ross's essay. The cloistered scientist shielded from self-critical knowledge about the social origins and conditions of his or her instruments, empirical methods and research applications has emerged as a much greater danger to, to our social and environmental survival than the cloistered humanist. Indeed, the social education of scientists is increasingly seen as one of the more, more important pedagogical tasks of the day. Okay? Now, um, you may as scientists, as budding technologists, you may think that this is quite an un, you know, um, unkind cut, so to speak, you know, to talk about scientists in this way. But, um, well, I may say this is perhaps the reason why we have humanities and social sciences in the IITs and in different, you know, uh, institutions in the country and abroad, okay, where it is part and parcel of uh, the curricula, uh, you know, to be taught to engineering students. This is the reason, okay. Uh, we run the risk um, of becoming uh, sort of um, a technological tyrants, if you will, okay, where, we, where we give so much importance to science, so much importance to technology that we forget, right? We forget to look reflexively in at our own work, as is, as he says here. To you know, this applies also to cyber, you know cyber culture, and that is why you know this is uh, this slide is quite the link between what we are going to do today and we what did in the last lecture. So, if you do not have, you know, an idea of the social origins of your methods, however empirical they are. Okay? If you um, are not aware of where your research methods come from and if you, if you think that they are, so these are isolated from human life, from social conditions then you are entirely wrong and that is why it is important for us to, you know, to dwell upon areas like science, technology and society, science, technology and culture, on cyber culture, new media, etc. So, that even as we use, right, even if we use, as we use science and technology, we are, we should be aware that we, you know, these are not greater than us. We are the ones who have created them and we have, we are the ones who have created them using certain methods. Now, if you are uh, you know, blindly supportive of a method, if method becomes a deity to you, then even science itself cannot progress, because methods have to be improvised, methods have to be improved, methods have to be queried. And you will also know that the best of scientists have done this. Okay, and that is why it is said that he who is not a philosopher also cannot be a true scientist. Right? So, um, you look at so many uh, great scientists uh, in the world and you also look at the ones who have like Heisenberg for instance and others like Stephen Hawking, right, who are today uh, not simply 
you know, well read and who are not, not simply masters in their fields, but have also okay, uh, talked about science from the philosophical point of view and looked at their own methods. right? So, uh, this lecture also ties in with a lecture which I had given, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in which, which forms I think the fourth or fifth lecture in this module, which was on the new media. Okay. And um, the new media, which is as you know to do with the digital technology and which we, you know, which is differentiated from the old media by the fact that digital media should be in you know obviously the digital medium, but it has not to be only stored, but it has to be distributed and exhibited using the new uh, you know using the digital form, right. So, in the new media also we find that there is a greater potential for a cyber democracy or genuine public opinion, where the subject is not preformed, but is able to refashion himself or herself. So, new media and cyber culture are often talked about together. If you recall in the lecture on new media, we made a difference, a differentiation between new media and, and cyber culture. Okay? And today, we are going to look at cyber culture after having seen what new media is and we are going to talk about the cultural studies exploration of cyber media. Okay. So, the topic of discussion today is cyber culture and let me declare the key text, source text in this lecture. I shall be uh, at times uh, taking out extracts from you know these lectures. Most of the points that I shall be talking about here are gleaned from these, um, these essays and books. Okay. So, so, we have Chris G uh, Hebel's Gray, Cyborg Citizen, Donna Haraway's A Manifesto for Cyborgs, Mark Posters, Postmodern Virtualities and Catherine Hales's How We Became Posthuman and Promote Ken Nyers and Introduction to New Media and Cultural Studies. Now, obviously, these by no means are the only books as I have always said in my lectures, these are not the only books with which you can build a discourse of cyber culture. You have, um, you have very, uh, you know, you have a very, very well known and um, uh, in well known uh, books that are textbooks, we have cyber culture, cyber cultures readers for instance, which you may go and uh, you know uh, read if you are interested in this field. But for the purposes of this lecture in order also to show the variety of thinking okay, within, these, uh, within this domain, these are the books and essays that I have brought uh, for you. Fine. So, we are now going to read from an important uh, trilogy. The trilogy is by Manuel Castles and the trilogy, the three, three works together are called the information age. The, this is a landmark trilogy in the study of information, in the study uh, you know of network societies. In fact, the first volume of this trilogy is entitled rise of the network society from which I am taking this quotation uh, simply because it is, <coughs> it has been so beautifully put and it you know, it is a fitting epigraph, you know, to our lecture. Fine. So, I am reading from Manuel Castles, The Information Age. Our world and our lives are being shaped by the conflicting trends of globalization and identity. The information technology revolution and the restructuring of capitalism have induced a new form of society called the network society. It is characterized by globalization or strategically decisive economic activities. Now, the whole concept of the network society, okay, uh, the way society is radically or connected or networked, you know in a radically new way, right? the way communication, uh, the communication revolution has sort of created this network society has not to be understood only in technological terms. And uh, Castles has therefore, immediately you know pointed to the fact that the network society is characterized by a by globalization of strategically decisive economic activities okay? and the information technology revolution has led to a restructuring of capitalism. Right? So, in these kind of books, important books, you find you know sociologists and cultural scientists drawing these connections between a new uh, revolution 
which is the information technology revolution, which is still within the capitalist format, okay, within the capitalist modes of production, but also agreeing, uh, you know, that there is a restructuring of such, you know, of, of the old capitalist order, and that it is strategically, it is related to economic activities. Then uh, he goes on to say, by the networking form of organization. Okay, by the cul a culture, and this is a very famous phrase by Manuel Castle, a culture of real virtuality. Now, it may seem to be you know a paradox, what do you mean by real when re virtuality, when real and virtual are opposites. Okay? The real is usually uh, you know considered in opposition to the virtual, but he says here there is a culture of actual virtuality okay? and which, some, which is something we cannot ignore and he says by a culture of real virtuality constructed by a pervasive interconnected and diversified media system and by the transformation of material foundations of this is important transformation this is where the cultural studies uh, interrogation comes in that this kind of a culture right a way of life of you know actual virtuality or real virtuality um, is been formed by the transformation of material foundations of life, space and time as expressions of dominant activities and con controlling elites. It is indeed brave or not a new world. Okay? So, we need to look at new media and cyber cultures as at the same time, you know, being a continuation and being just newer forms right, uh, of the capitalist order, though quite radical, radically. And at the same time, as Manuel Castle says here, of something that, that is creating a, a new world, brave or not. Now, this obviously alludes to a book. Some of you are, you know, I am sure you have read this book. The name of the book is Brave New World okay, by Aldous Huxley. Okay. So, he says whether it is uh, the kind of world that has been shown by you know Aldous Huxley in his work The Brave New World, we have to understand that we are indeed in a new world with the coming in of the network society. Then fine, uh, we are talking about cyber culture, it is important for us to, uh, to you know to first talk about where what the word cyber means. Right. We talk about cyberpunk, cyber fiction, cyber culture, um, you know, cybernetics. So, where does the word cyber come from? The word cyber is actually a prefix. Okay? It is a prefix um, from the Greek word Kubernetes, this is the word Kubernetes, okay? which means steersman or, or somebody who uh, is skilled in steering or in governance. In a sense, it also means a leader. Okay? And this steering and this governing is through control, which is of course, done in any kind of steering or governance, but this is through electronic control. Okay? Remember again, the term cyber okay, is actually a prefix and it comes from the Greek word uh, Kubernetes. Cybernetics come from the Greek word Kubernetes, meaning steersman or somebody who is skilled in steering and governance, and uh, it means control, particularly in the electronic form. Okay? It was first used, uh, if you look at the slide, by Norbert Weiner in one of his, uh, I think it was in the 1940s, if I am not mistaken, Norbert Weiner's Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and Machine. So, this word became uh, very popular after Norbert Weiner's book. So, well, uh, we are now going to look at uh, you know the electronic environment, so to speak, and the various components of cyber culture. And we are going to uh, uh, see, you know, look at it the way Pramod Nair, uh, you know, gives us these areas in his book, An Introduction to New Media and Cult Cyber Cultures, another book which is very uh, useful, extremely readable, and I would uh, not hesitate to, you know, to suggest that you read this book. So, the electronic environment where various technologies and media forms converge is what is known as cyber culture. Uh, and part of it is also media culture or sorry new media and these are the internet, video games, email, home pages, online chats, bioinformatics etcetera. Okay? So, the, this essentially again is again if you, you, you can understand why Castles use the word network society. All these are to do 
uh, with networking. Even video games are what you play often with people on a network, right? So, the, this is basically the electronic environment a new environment definitely that we are talking about and we shall see what the cultural implications are of this new environment. Right? So, cyber culture studies um, according to Nair extends the work of cultural criticism and cultural studies. Right? This is important. It extends the work of cultural criticism and cultural studies by locating cyber cultures as affected by and affecting individual identities of individuals sorry actual identities of individuals right so the work that i said the work work on identity and subjectivity right two you know you could say two of the most important words among along with words like discourse power and representation two also very important words in uh, you know as far as the tools of uh, cultural studies are concerned and he says that uh, cyber culture the coming in of cyber culture has extended the work so to speak of cultural studies um, as far as identity formation is concerned and the actual identities of individuals are played out are related to the context in which they develop and the conditions under which it, they are formed. So, therefore, we may say that there are new configurations um, in cyber culture these new configurations may be said to develop around the concept of individuality and identity. Okay? Individuality is never the same with cyber, you know, once cyber culture comes into the picture. Okay? What it means to be an individual. Okay? So, in this way you can still, you can also say that this, we may replace this with the word subjectivity and we saw that subjectivity and identity are two of the most important words in cultural studies. So, in the, what is, in the, what is an individual? Right? Does an individual remain <coughs> excuse me, an isolated individual once he or she is in a network society? How is his or her subjectivity changed, reformed, reconstructed or reconfigured as if you like okay, by uh, once one is in the cyber space or once, uh, once one is in cyber culture. So, individuality and ideas of it go through radical changes as also we find there are new configurations as far as identity is concerned. So, uh, what are the key issues therefore, if you are doing a cultural studies analysis okay, of cyber culture, the culture or the way of life of you know in, in the electronic environment, let us put it that way cyber culture may be called the way of life and the practices. Okay, including in identity and subjecti subjectivity formation, including representation, etcetera, in an electronic environment, right? So there are many key issues, and those of you who are, um, you know, not just not at the, you know, undergraduate level, those of you who are who are listening to me, who are looking at this video, who are also students, um, you know, at higher levels, can also, if you if you if you wish to work, and uh, do your research on cyber uh, cyber culture. Uh, can look at many of these aspects, okay? but even at the undergraduate level it is important for us to know the scope, right? the scope of uh, cultural studies analysis of cyber culture or cyber culture criticism. Fine, among these are let me read them out globalization, techno capitalism, cyber cultures these are all given in Promote Nair's book, materiality and corporeality, the digital divide, e-governance, civil society, identity and subjectivity, race and class, genders and sexualities. This could also include virtual citizenship and human rights. For instance, you know what kind of human rights can you, uh, you know, uh, uh, do we reformulate or how, how is the whole idea of human rights reformulated once we are in, you know, in a cyber world or once we are cyborgs that is once we use prosthetics, once we use uh, say for instance, uh, once we, uh, we are implanted with a chip. Right? In that case, are we, are we human? Uh, how far do we say that we are human? And if we are partly with technology and we are being aided by technology and or we are with what we call augmented. Uh, technology, technology that augments our sense organs or you know sense you know our senses. In that case, the human rights that we are talking about today are they going to remain the same, right? So we also have you know uh, in books like Cyborg Citizen, um, you know talking about new kind of rights, 
uh, new kind of manifestos and understandings of newer understandings of what human rights may be, the whole idea of participatory evolution and not simply natural evolution um, and how you know these are new terms that have come up. So, what does it mean to be a virtual citizen? What are the rules you know in virtual citizenship? Then how is the pu public sphere? Right, we know that the public sphere is a term that we have from the philosopher Habermas, right? And we did allude to it in one of our previous lectures. So, how is the public sphere reconfigured, right? When one is in a networked plane, right? One is in an electronic environment. Then there are issues, definitely, of eroticism of sexuality, uh, which we call techno eroticism of cyber sex. Then techno addiction, like addiction to technology, right? Uh, prosthetics and also these new movements. This is very important from both a philosophical and cultural studies point of view. These new epistemologies and these new movements that uh, have emerged, namely post industrialism, post humanism, and post modernism, and how these relate, okay, how these relate. Uh, relate to cyber culture as a whole. So, you see in these two slides, you find that there are indeed so many almost 20 more than 20 areas that we have delineated. Of course, we are not going to talk about all of these, it is uh, well you know, impossible to do so, but uh, we have seen you know the enormous scope of uh, where to apply uh, critical tools from cultural studies as we study you know cyber culture. Now, um, Talking about, uh, talking about race, talking about um, inequality in cyberspace or you know, um, in, in virtual reality, we have uh, we may refer to uh, an important essay by Mark Poster, which is also one of our key source texts, Postmodern Virtualities. And I just want to read here from here to show how critics like uh, you know cultural critics like Mark Poster working on the you know interface between a virtual virtuality and postmodernism, posthumanism, etc. How they have also brought in issues of, um, you know, inequality among different nations, for instance. Right? Let's look at what he has to say. Right? The political implications of the internet for the fate of the nation state and the development of a global community also requires attention. That is in cultural studies. The dominant use of English, look at this, the dominant use of English on the internet suggests the extension of American power. Now, just a while ago we said that the you know cyber democracy has uh, enormous potential even in the new media, the, uh, my lecture on in the new media, discussion in the new media, we found that um, the internet um, has been celebrated by so many. Uh, scholars, so many you know, uh, members of the intelligentsia yeah, as having immense potential uh, for cyber democracy, right. But uh, scholars like uh, Poster also point to another aspect of it and he says that uh, we cannot deny the fact that English is the dominant language on the internet and he says here it suggests the extension of American power, okay. And he points to an important fact here as he says at least at the time when he was writing this essay. Um, the fact that email addresses in the US alone do not require a country code. Okay? Uh, as a person not from, you know, the, uh, from, um, um, from computer sciences or electronics, I cannot tell you exactly how this is done, but, but suffice it for us to follow what Mark Poster is saying that, you know, even as we talk about talk about uh, you know the, uh, the tremendous democratic potential of the electronic environment, there is still an inequality in the balance of power. So, the, the internet normalizes American users, okay? then puts them keep makes them a norm, normalizes American users, um, but the issue is more complex. Okay. In Singapore, English serves to enable conversations between hostile ethnic groups, on the other hand we should also we can also uh, say that there are uh, you know even without the you know people who started this you know people who gave us the internet okay science computer scientists who gave us the internet for instance even they could not possibly have thought you know of of things like this for instance uh, as he says here in singapore english serves to enable conversations between hostile ethnic groups 
But then again, Poster says that still does not do away with the fact that vast inequalities of views exist, changing the democratic structure of the internet into an occasion for what he so says very strongly further wrongs to the poorer nations. Fine. This is just one example of you know all these things that we have talked about, for instance, race and uh, ethnicities or nation states, for instance, okay, where uh, the critique of of cyber culture could be applied and uh, Mark Poster's um, you know extract the extract from Mark Poster's essay is just one example of the way these complexities okay, are to be uh, foregrounded by cultural studies scholars, right. So, um, well what, what are the other terms by which we describe cyber culture? Okay? It is also known as the second media age. This is a point that we also came across in our new media lecture. Okay. Uh, it is a second media because it is radically different in you know uh, in certain configurations in distribution particularly in distribution and um, uh, exhibition from the older media. Right? Um, it is the second media age also very importantly in the sense that the first media age of radio, television, um, of books, right, of film uh, were associated if you remember associated with mass culture, hmm, with mass culture and uh, with modernism, right. So, if the old media sorry that is the first media age was related to or was an outcome of modernism. This new second media age of electronic environments okay, of network society, uh, this environment is a result of uh, postmodern culture uh, as it also contributes to the building of postmodernism. Okay. And therefore, it is characterized by two things which is postmodern uh, culture or way of life and the new communications system, a communication system which is different in many ways to be recognized as which, which you know um, uh, which sort of deserves to be recognized as a new phase or a second media age, more about postmodernism a while later. Therefore, the cultural formations in this new electrical uh, sorry electronic environment um, are two things one is the information superhighway and the other is virtual reality okay so you know that these two for for as cultural formations may be talked about separately the scholars who work only on information highway and the scholars who work only on virtual reality okay on on uh, you know uh, the reality that is obviously you know what virtual reality is a reality that is created okay where you know uh, you are in an environment where which is not real but which is virtual okay so these are the new cultural configurations <laughs> and what happens to identity on the information superhighway what happens to a virtue to identity and subjectivity in virtual reality i would think are the two main in, you know uh, main questions in cultural studies investigation of cyber culture right so, uh, again from Mark Poster and just it is I am reading this to you because he puts it so beautifully. This is what happens okay, in virtual reality and uh, virtual reality and uh, information highway cultural formations and I am reading his words the new technologies install the interface. Now, he calls this the face between the faces, the face that insists that we remember that we have faces, that we have sides that are present at the moment of utterance, that we are not present in any simple or immediate way. This is so befitting, you know, so well put. Okay. Uh, identity in the virtual world, okay. uh, the fact that you can have several avatars right, in, a, in a virtual reality environment. Okay. Uh, you know uh, gives you so many faces. Now, by faces obviously, he does not mean faces as we talk about a face, but he means so many aspects to your subjectivity particularly to your identity. Okay. I would say both right. So, in the sense that you, you have an identity as a flesh and blood person, but in the virtual uh, world the world of virtual reality you may take on uh, so many identities okay as i said you can take so many avatars take on so many avatars and that is why he says you know the face between the faces so beautifully put the face between the faces the face that insists that we remember that we have not one face but faces many faces we have sides 
uh, that are present at the moment of utterance and that we are not present in any simple or immediate way. Okay. In the electronic environment, identity therefore and subjectivity is uh, made more complex, particularly of the dual level. You know, you are a flesh and blood person living in the so called real world okay, and in the virtual world, you also have uh, another or several other identities, which makes the whole you know uh, the whole idea of identity a fragmented one, and that is why it is part of postmodernism, which believes okay, which believes in uh, such fragmentation, which believes that there is no coherent you know identity in any human being, even in the human being's flesh and blood uh, blood um, in sort of real world um, apparition, right? not only in that, but you know or rather even in even in our so called uh, flesh and blood avatar, we have you know a fragmented identity. Add to it the you know the multifaceted identities you can take uh, take off from Mark Poster, multifaceted identities, multifaces in uh, the sci you know in cyber world in virtual reality. What happens is the whole idea of even fragmented identities takes on a very different or a much more uh, you know uh, uh, much more complex and difficult um, difficult contours. So, subjectivity then in cyberspace is related uh, to you know in in uh, the first media age to modernity or the mode of production and uh, which are where which gave us patterned practices and, and an instrumental rationality. Okay. And in the second media age, that is of virtual reality and cyber culture, we have postmodernity or the mode of information. So, you see here is the mode of production and this is characterized by the mode of information, where identities and subjectivities are unstable, multiple and diffuse. On the other hand, subjectivity was to do with you know it uh, with patterned practices and, and a more or less stable identity, okay. but this is radically broken in postmodernity. Um, as a result of uh, the virtual world. Then also postmodernism and internet narratives, right. Uh, postmodernism as I said a while ago that I explained how it, it is postmodern. Postmodernism does not believe in grand narratives, okay. Postmodernism believes that all grand narratives are false. Right? Why? Because only reason cannot, uh, you know, as especially instrumental rationality, um, uh, ha, you know, is always suspect. It cannot give us the entire truth. There are issues of power and legitimation behind the so-called, you know, truths with the capital T, as we put it, given to us. And it believes in micro narratives. It believes that every culture, every subculture, has a narrative, and it is only the dominant culture which forwards to you a grand narrative because of issues of power and legitimacy right and there is paralogy or what we call resistance to established reasoning and the whole idea is one of difference a celebration of difference and a celebration of a non totalitarian view of the world okay the non totalitarian view of the world therefore ties in with the micro narratives small narratives every ethnic group every nation right has its own narratives to say about reality about its own history etc any you know sweeping narrative is always suspect so postmodernism therefore you know ties in with the proliferation of internet narratives right in that sense of course in the internet is extremely liberating because everyone finds a voice there right everyone can uh, you know contribute his or her micro narrative then Catherine N. Hales uh, is another very important scholar uh, who I refer to in my uh, you know list of books for this uh, for this um, lecture, and she says that this has this is, has a, almost a revolutionary element. Okay, virtual reality, cyber culture has bring has brought in a new revolution, where and I'm quoting from Hales here: humans were to be seen primarily as information processing entities. Okay, humans are defined as information. Remember we said that in our science technology and culture lecture, remember we said that you know uh, increasingly we are defining ourselves with respect to science and technology with respect to the various domains. Here too from the domain of the electronic environment, we are we describe we are being increasingly described as information processing entities who are essentially similar to intelligent machines. 
Okay. Now, the complex interplays between embodied forms of subjectivity and arguments for disembodiment throughout the cybernetic tradition is one of the core, okay, one of the core areas of, of inquiry and research in, in cultural studies. Look at this, the complex interface, we interplays, we were just talking about this a while ago, the complex interplay that happens once you realize the difference between an embodied person with a certain subjectivity okay, and this, um, the, you know, the, this embodied being that you are in cyberspace okay, throughout the cybernetic tra tradition. So, the core issue if I may, if we may zoom into one certainly what Hale says okay, which is the complexity uh, and the both the divide and the complexity that is there in understanding feeling ourselves in our, in our knowing or having an experience of our subjectivity A as an embodied being flesh and blood being and B as somebody in cyberspace or virtual reality with the experience of disembodiment. Then Donna Haraway is one person we cannot leave out and I think we will quickly end by looking at, um, by looking at uh, her work and um, uh, one of her most famous uh, wor works is an essay really which is entitled um, uh, you know uh, this uh, a manifesto for cyborgs and the word cyborg is really uh, what we call a portmanteau word or you know with two words parts of you know words are brought together two words are brought together okay the cyborg is the cyber part of it is cybernetic and the org is from organism so it is a short form for cybernetic organism so obviously a cyborg is then uh, usually uh, if I may put it that way, usually a human being, okay, who is, um, you know, an organism in cyberspace, right? Not only in cyberspace, but who also uh, may be augmented by technology. So, a cyborg, she says, is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction social reality is lived social relations our most important political construction a world changing fiction. The boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion which he puts it very correctly. Okay. We I am sure those of you who are avid readers of science fiction novels okay, or, or short stories uh, would today find that many of uh, you know many of the uh, many of the scientific predictions. Um, if not most of them are uh, that are that were there in which seem to be fantasy for us in science fiction um, uh, are coming true in today's world. One of the works that I may refer to and you would really enjoy reading is this novel if you have not read it yet this novel entitled Neuromancer by William Gibson. Okay. Now, many of the things that were written in his novel, um, his fantasy novel Neuromancer are things that uh, you know, uh, which is about uh, Neuromancer is about uh, cyber hacker okay? and many of the things described there are so uncannily similar to you know, uh, uh, you know to the problems and issues and the experience of life in cyberspace and in virtual reality. Right? So, that is why she says Donna Haraway rightly says the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion because it is already coming to be true. Then she says by the late now I am quoting those uh, you know lines which are very striking uh, both in their rhetoric and in their in their argument right? and that is why I would like to share these with you. By the late 20th century our time we are all chimeras the theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short we are we are cyborgs the cyborg is our ontology it gives us our politics the cyborg is our ontology we could also rephrase it as saying the cyborg is our identity the cyborg is essentially who we are today. Okay? It gives us our politics right. Now, the way the cyborg is described by Chris Hebel's Gray in Cyborg Citizen, a book that I mentioned a while ago, which talks about the whole, all the issues regarding uh, participatory development, um, you know, issues of citizenship, of human rights, etc., in the cyber world, and he describes a cyborg. Uh, in you know in in uh, this way, which is very in, uh, very easy to understand, 
and I am quoting from Gray, a, a cyborg is a self-regulating system that combines the natural and the artificial together in one system. Let us underline this, cyborgs do not have to be part human. For any organism that mixes the evolved and the made, the living and the inanimate is technically a cyborg. If you have been technologically modified in any significant way from an implanted pacemaker to a vaccination that reprogrammed your immune system, then you are definitely a cyborg. This is of course, a very broad you know definition of cyborg and uh, elsewhere I think it is uh, Gray himself and others also who have said that the moment you are wearing a watch, right? the main moment you are wearing a watch, you are already into you know already into the uh, you know uh, broadly speaking into the cyber world okay here cyber world doesn't have to mean an electronic environment as such okay so the moment you are uh, sort of augmented by the watch the moment you are as i said if you have a have a pacemaker implanted in you okay and if, <coughs> even if you are vaccinated which means that you've already entered the world of the made and not the world of the naturally evolved okay therefore this is a post human world by post humanism you mean um, you know a way of thinking in which the human is no longer the central point of reference right as it says here in this slide the human is no longer the point of reference okay and there is a radically new and complex lived experience post humanism doesn't only mean this is very important as a school of thought it doesn't only mean that we are related to machines it also means that we are related to other animals. Okay. So, the machine part of it of course, is highlighted here, uh, but remember that in other works of Do you know scholars like Donna Haraway for instance, you will find that these issues have been taken up our relation to animals etcetera, okay, not just to machines. So, let us come to the discussion in the end and um, just one or two questions to help you you know revise uh, some of the points here. If you ask the question like what is the etymology of the term cybernetics. Now, do you remember what we have uh, you know that uh, this was a point that was discussed long ago. If you do not remember that let me give it to you. <coughs> the word uh, the etymology is <coughs> the, the Greek word kubernetes right cyber is a prefix um, and cybernetics is related to Kubernetes, the Greek word for steersman, which also means anyone who is skilled in steering and that is in governance. Right? The important point here is the steering or the governance is or the is a control that is in the electronic environment and that is electronic in nature. Okay? And it was made, this term was made famous and popular by Norbert Weiner's seminal work cybernetics or control and communication in the animal and machine. Then what are the key issues in cultural studies analysis of cyber culture as we found so many of these and you, you can if you want if you get a much longer answer you can talk about uh, you can mention all these and talk about some of these in detail like we have done about identity and subjectivity okay, about corporeality and materiality of uh, virtual citizenship uh, and of posthumanism and postmodernism. So, these are some of the areas as you know you just have to learn these uh, if you are asked a question on the scope okay, of cultural studies analysis. So, what is uh, the relationship between postmodernism and cyber culture? Then the answer is the relationship is may be answered or the, the question of the relationship may be answered partly with an appeal to an important term or key concept in cultural studies namely subjectivity. And you can say that postmodernity is related to uh, you know cyber culture because postmodernity is not you know uh, related to the mode of production as much as it is related to the mode of information okay. and subjectivity uh, in cyber culture in the virtual world like subjectivity as is understood by postmodernism is unstable okay multiple right and diffuse whereas we found that in in modernity right subjectivity has to do with the mode of production and an instrumental rationality that gives you a subjectivity which is you know which comes about 
in a predictable way, which is to do with repeated patterns, which is not at least as unstable multiple and diffuse as identity sorry subjectivity and indeed also identity in, um, in uh, uh, postmodernism. And also postmodernism is related uh, to the cyber culture, because internet narratives also allows the proliferation of micro narratives, uh, where there is resistance to established way of thinking, established way of reasoning and there is a celebration as in postmodernism of difference and non totalizing theories and non totalizing understandings of subjectivity and, and, and identity are um, encouraged in, uh, in, in the ethos of cyber culture. Okay. So, uh, this uh, we come to the end of our lecture on cyber culture and we also come in you know uh, to the end of these in, to a group of lectures in the fourth module which were devoted to science and technology to new media okay uh, to, uh, you know to virtual and uh, cyber culture and um, i hope this was interesting for you and those of you who are who would like to know more about it can uh, you know, there is a lot of literature, uh, not only in the shape of printed books, but all in the form of printed books, but also so much as they are available on the internet. If you look at these with some degree of discretion and uh, you know intelligent choice, then there is a lot to be learned. Why? Because this is something, even if you are in the third world, this is something that you are using. You are most of you are on as students are on the internet, most of you you know are engaged in, in these things. Um, online chats, emails, etcetera, the whole internet environment. Okay. So, you have to understand even as you use it that these are new ways of subjectivities and identities that are being formed. It is very important for us right, as users not to simply know the theory, but or, you know hands on even as you are using these things to understand what kind of identity am I shaping for myself. Okay, what kind of subjectivity is happening as I am in this online conversation? Okay, uh, what are the different avatars that I may be showing or my, maybe even developing as I am in the uh, world of the cyber or in virtual reality? Thank you so much.